Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the Atlantic's Exploration of the Future of Democracy. Hello, welcome. I'm Anna Bross, Senior Vice President of Communications for the Atlantic, and I'm so pleased to have you all with us today. I know you have a lot of options, so thank you for being here. The Atlantic was founded 165 years ago as a magazine to, among other things, pursue truth and challenge assumptions without regard to party or clique. And this event is the live expression of that journalism. Today, our journalists will unpack the most consequential issues of our time with elected officials and national leaders. Our sessions will explore the state of democracy in America and around the world, the evolution of the nation's political parties, challenges to voting rights and the urgent need to ensure free and fair elections, civil rights and the future of immigration. We hope that by the end of today's events, you have left feeling challenged and motivated. Before we get started, a huge thank you to South by Southwest for partnership and for supporting our journalism. And now, for our first discussion on the future of global democracy, please welcome to the stage the 52nd Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi. Here to lead the conversation is my colleague Evan Smith, a contributing writer for The Atlantic and co-founder of the Texas Tribune. Thank you so much. Anna, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm so honored to be on stage once again in Austin with the most powerful and impactful woman in the annals of American politics, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, who served in Congress for more than 35 years, representing much of the city of San Francisco as well as San Francisco County. She has served during seven different presidential administrations, from Reagan to Biden, and has held a variety of leadership posts in the U.S. House over that time. Minority Whip, Leader of the Democratic Caucus, Minority Leader, and of course, Speaker, twice, each time for two terms. She was chosen for the top job by her colleagues first in 2007, the first woman ever to serve in that capacity, and again in 2019. I will note, it did not take 15 rounds of votes for her to get the gavel <laughs> either time. <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, welcome. It's very, very nice to have you here. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm so impressed on a Sunday morning early <laughs> to see so many folks out and about. We have to make sure uh, we uh, honor the belief that they brought in here that uh, something good can happen. You give us hope by being here. Thank you. Well, let's make good happen. Let's, let's start off by talking about a little news. We're going to talk about the future of global democracy today, but I want to start off by talking about Silicon Valley Bank. Biggest bank collapse, biggest bank collapse in 15 years, not literally, but essentially in your backyard in Northern California. I know there was an FDIC briefing yesterday for the California delegation. What do you know? What do you think? What's gonna happen? Well, good morning. <laughs> I'm using my hour, Speaker. This is how this goes. We're not wasting any time. Let me just put this in a, in, it's all about time. It's about, everything's about time, the most finite of all uh, commodities. And one thing, whatever, any differences of opinion that anybody has about how we go forward, they want it to happen by tomorrow morning before the markets open. So time is important in this. Let me just give you a little background. I was speaker when we wrote the Dodd-Frank bill uh, to make sure that what had happened before uh, we would be protected from. Uh, and we did the TARP bill, all of that. The previous president to this one, when he was in office. <laughs> N nicely done. <laughs> he uh, advocated for reducing some of those protections. And that happened in his tax giveaway bill uh, to the top 1%, 83% of the benefits going to the top 1%. But at the same time, he removed many of these protections, and that if they were still in place and the bank had to honor them, this might have been, might have been avoided. So what do we, who do we want to protect? I don't think there's any appetite in the country for bailing out a bank 
I do think that we know that we must honor the depositors, the FDIC, up until $250,000. That is what the law is. We actually try to make that higher for protection of small businesses and the rest. The Republicans refuse to do that because the big, big banks wanted to be able to attract those depositors. In any event, we have, a, shall we say, a little difference of perspective about who we're there to protect. Okay, so protect the, pro the, uh, the depositors. That is a given up to the 250. We'd like it to go higher because many small businesses fall in that category, and we'll see. Secondly, many of the businesses that have their accounts at that bank have a, the money there so that they can p make the, pay the payroll. So if, that, if this bank fails, what we're concerned about is the payroll of the workers in the companies, many of them small businesses. So that's a protection we must have. And at our meeting <clears throat> last night with the FDIC, uh, the Californians, it was California Democrats, but all saying <clears throat> we must protect the, uh, the payroll of the workers. In, Depositors, the workers. In terms of the investors, <clears throat> many of them, when I say investors, are small businesses, entrepreneurs, this or that. And if this bank fails, excuse me. They have, for example, I'll give you an example that I've been hearing the last 48 hours. Many are biotech, and biotech their assets are frozen. I don't mean frozen financial assets. I mean scientific research, frozen as they prepare to do their further research. If they can't pay the payroll or the electric, the utility bill and the rest of them, that all literally goes down the drain. So there are lots of reasons why we should be selectively approaching this about what, um, what we want to protect. We do not want contagion, where, where some people in a smaller bank someplace else say, oh, if that bank goes, my bank may go. People standing in line to take their money out. We don't want this to be systemic because that would be harmful to the economy and the rest. So what are the options? One, as I said, we protect the, the, the two categories I already mentioned. But in terms of the bank, what we would hope to see by tomorrow morning is some other bank to buy the bank. So this is not taxpayer money bailing out a bank. Are you aware, Speaker, of anybody in, uh, in the water on that? Talking I am, about that? but I, I'm not sure I should. <laughs> J just in this room. We won't tell anybody else. <laughs> More than one. More so than so it's, it's, it's a non-zero possibility that by tomorrow that bank will have been acquired. It, it's, it, there, there's I mean, a real possibility. There's a possibility that by <laughs> yes, tomorrow oh, yes. that will have actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. But it requires the regulators and everybody to act in a timely way. For example, in order for a per possible um, purchaser, another bank to purchase, they need the information. They need to have the data that, of what is going on in the bank and that. And so it needs cooperation from the um, regulators. And that's what we were encouraging the regulators. Whatever you're doing, do it in a way that facilitates a, um, a purchase rather than facilitates the FDIC being the owner of this bank, which is the path we're on now. The other thing is there's something called the uh, open market window. The open market window of the Fed is a place where assets from all of these banks that have any questionable strength, those assets can be in, put through the op, uh, open market window and depositors, investors, everybody who has a stake in this, payrolls, all of that can be dealt with in a way that is uh, helpful for the future, protects the interest of the taxpayer, but addresses 
the, the urgency of small businesses, people who are employed by companies who have their payroll fund uh, uh, managed, they call it custodial responsibility uh, for paying the bills for companies with the money in the bank. They don't put their money under a mattress, they put it in the bank for it to do their business for them. So it's about the worker, it's about small business, it's about the depositor, and hopefully somebody will buy the bank, but I don't see any appetite for the federal government to bail out the bank. Okay, well, I think there's a bunch of news in that. Let's, uh, let's let that sit and let's move on to the topic at hand, Speaker, that is the future of global democracy. But since we lead by example here, I thought we might actually talk about the state of our democracy before we look around the world. Give us a high-level sense of how healthy you think our democracy is in this country right now. High level. Well, never underestimate the United States of America. Let's just put it in history. At the beginning of our country, our founders, imagine the brilliance of the vision that they had, the first ever to found a country built on a principle of equality. Not that our founding documents followed through with all of that, but thank God they made them amendable, the Constitution amendable. So in the history of our country, we have always expanded freedom. From the beginning, we had awful things in the Constitution. Then the abolition of slavery, black men being able to vote, women being able to vote. Uh, more recently, you see marriage equality, the uh, respect for marriage uh, held up in the Supreme Court. Ever expanding democracy, freedom. Democracy is a freedom is what it means to you in your lives until the Dobbs decision. This was the first time in our country where we pulled back from freedom. And that is really, it has ramificate, well, well, it's a kitchen table issue. How could the federal government or any government or any politicians being telling people the size and timing of their family and, and what they can do about it and we're following you on your app to find out your, what you're doing month to month and all of that. This is a terrible thing. That's one thing that relates directly to people's lives. At the same time, as you saw on January 6th, there is a sentiment in our country that is anarchist. It just definitely is. Now, we always like to be respectful of everybody's view, and we always want to find our common ground. And I just don't know why there aren't more responsible Republicans saying, this isn't what our party is. I keep saying to my Republican friends, and I do have some, <laughs> take back your party. Take back your party. You are a grand old party. You've done great things for our country. The country needs a strong Republican party. Instead, you've turned into a cult to a thug. I'm being, it's Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> I want to be truthful with you. You, you go. <laughs> and, and that's just not good for the country. And there are very few people in the, in the leadership or in the um, history, of, uh, you know, past record of our Republican Party who are speaking out on this. But they must. Because, again, the country needs to have the debate on the role of government. That has been... Uh, respected since the beginning of our country. What is the role of government? What is the role of the federal government? That's a legitimate debate. Very conservative is a legitimate place to be on the spectrum of all of that debate. But radical, right-wing, destructive, led by somebody who just feeds the flame is a problem that we must face and we must win in our own country. But I'll tell you to go back to Dobbs. I've been with a lot of women this week for the, from all over the world for the women's, uh, International Women's Day the other day, but we observed it before and after and all. 
And they've said, when that decision came down in America, it was very demoralizing to women throughout the world. So uh, to get to your point, it's about our example. Have no doubt, have no doubt that we will have a path to strengthen our democracy as a model to the world. And that doesn't mean suppressing, it means respecting other views, but to do so in a way that again honors the oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. We can do that, we will do that, and the most important way to do that is in elections. You just have to win. And it doesn't mean Democrats have to win, it just means people who believe in their oath of office have to win whatever party they belong to. Speaker, you called out 1-6 and you actually used the word anarchy. This uh, brings to mind the cover story in The Atlantic this month by my colleague Adrian LaFrance about the rise and honestly the normalization of political violence in this country as one emblem at the moment of a broken democracy. She says specifically, we're moving towards slow motion anarchy. That is her phrase. And she cites as examples, not just 1-6, but the attempted kidnapping of Governor Whitmer in Michigan, the attempted breach of the FBI's field office in Cincinnati, the attempted murder of local Democratic officials in New Mexico by a failed statewide Republican candidate there. Speaker, political violence has found its way into your house. This is personal for you. Can you explain how we got here? How is it that we have now normalized violence in politics? Well, normalizing it is exactly the word because for some people, um, this seems to be a path that, look, I mean, why would so many people still vote Republican for candidates who support this? Many of the people who advocate for all of this and normalizing it are in the Congress of the United States. So we're not saying you don't have to vote Democratic. No, vote for Republicans who honor their oath of office. Yeah, my, I'm very happy my dear husband Paul was able to make this trip. This is highly unusual, but the, he's getting out now. Uh, it, <laughs> I was the target. He paid the price, so you can just imagine what my sentiment is about this. But uh, when you see on the other side a contest of how we can, it's like a limbo contest they're having with themselves, and how low can they go? How low can they go in, in feeding the flame? So what they do is they use cultural issues. They use cultural issues, whether it's a woman's right to choose, but it used to be called gays, God, and, and guns. Uh, the God piece being, in their view, a woman's right to choose. Secondly, the, the, the gun issue, and again, now we believe that people have a right, in Second Amendment, all the rest of that, but we do believe we should be protecting our children. Now, let me just say, they use that issue, though, in elections. They use the issue of LGBTQ in elections. They use the issue of women's rights choose in elections, which isn't really, I mean, the election is about our country. There are big issues, uh, kitchen table issues and the rest. But they win in the elections, they win in largely on the cultural issues. Uh, I, Paul and I have five children at six years and one week. I, I keep saying that to my archbishop. Um, and, uh, and we're thrilled and happy that God has blessed us in that way. No politician has any right to make any declaration about what somebody else should do in his or her private life, in my view. And so we have this <laughs> debate. And I say that on a Sunday morning as a very devout, practicing Catholic. My archbishop doesn't think that, but that's his problem, not mine. <laughs> so, okay, so when they go to these, the heart of these issues, and, and I have, I can tell you in Texas, there are certain parts of Texas where people would be so uh, advantaged 
by having different policies relating to the expansion of Medicaid and uh, all these other things that would help them. But abortion is their number one voting issue. Many of them Catholic, some of them people of faith, different religions, and we respect that, but it's how they vote. So we just have to, again, understand what this is about. It's about a fundamental respect for the dignity and worth of every person in a democracy to be able to live their lives um, now, since it's Sunday morning, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. It has nothing to do, really, with the question. <laughs> sort of. I, I've already given up on keeping this on track, so you go ahead. That's fine. It's Sunday morning. Yeah, that's good. So there was, see, uh, John Lewis, who I had the honor of serving with for over 30 years, he and I used to always talk about the spark of divinity that exists in every person. That when God came down from heaven, when Christ came down from heaven and participated in our humanity, he enabled us to participate in his divinity. There's a spark of divinity in every person, and we have to respect that, even if they're, you know, doing awful things. We have to respect that and respect it in our own self and the responsibility it gives us to respect. Now, the part I like that people... There was a... a Hebrew, I don't know if the word is theologian, but th person of faith in about the third century. And what he said was because of the spark of divinity that is inside each of us, at least 10,000 angels precede us every place we go. So when you're leaving here, make room for tens of thousands of angels preceding each and every one of you as you leave here. But this is about the dignity of people here and around the world. Whether you believe in that theologian, uh, that uh, Hebrew uh, thinker or not, the fact is uh, that we do have a responsibility if we believe that we're all God child God's children, that we are people of faith or no faith, but nonetheless, respectful of that, so that they use these techniques, these, shall we say, cultural issues to win elections, and a lot of it is money-driven. It's people who don't, big, rich people who don't want to pay more taxes and all the rest. They don't go out and say, let's have an election where you support me not paying more taxes. They say, we're going to take your gun away, you're, you're going to make you your son marry some guy, you know, they, they mischaracterize the values that many of us share. So that's what we're up against. But we must win it, and we don't win it by getting like them. You know, we get it by taking it to a higher level, and I'm very proud of the work that Joe Biden has done in that regard. On, on the question, of one six, though, specifically, just to try to bring us a little bit back closer to the original notion of political violence. Th this was a week in which we were actually talking quite a bit about one six, and that is because your successor, Speaker McCarthy, gave exclusive access to the footage from one six to Tucker Carlson, who then proceeded to go on Fox and mischaracterize what happened on that day. You know what happened on that day. Tucker Carlson said, among many other quotes I could cite, of the people who stormed the Capitol on 1-6, as a result of that footage, mischaracterizing it. They were peaceful, they were orderly and meek, they were not insurrectionist, they were sightseers. That was the word he used. Like that guy in the Viking helmet had a Fodor's guidebook with him. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, well, it's, it's incredible to me to think that this is where we are. I want you to talk about that. Well, here's the thing. We had a president of the United States who incited an insurrection. Many of these people, Respect whoever the president is. And if he says, go do this, they go do that. But that doesn't absolve them of their own personal responsibility. That day was as horrible as a day that you can imagine. They not only made an assault on the Capitol, this temple of democracy to the world, and the world was watching that, 
They made an assault on our Constitution, which called for that day to be the day that the Congress would certify the election of the President and Vice President of the United States by accepting the results of the Electoral College. So it was the, con built the Capitol, the Constitution, the Congress of the United States. Refusing to send us the National Guard and refusing by, on part of the President to call off, call this off. So sometimes it's really hard in all charity and respect for the dignity and worth to understand how other people don't understand that was very wrong. It did not honor our oath of office to protect and defend. It was dangerous, it was scary. I myself was a, a major target. They were gonna bullet in the head and all that. And, but I had security that got me out of there. I was very concerned about my members about the press who were there, about the staff who were traumatized, about the maintenance people who maintained the Capitol, who were being called horrible names and all the rest as these anarchists were making poo-poo on the floor of the Capitol. I mean, this was not a, a pretty sight. So something must be wrong with Tucker Carlson. If, and it's something must be wrong if somebody believes what he says about that. There's a different plan at work. There's money that, that, that runs a lot of it. And they do, what does he do? Get more viewers, more, uh, shall we say, um, enthusiastically misled by what he has to say. But we have to, we have to, it, with, again, respectful of, people that were whose minds were trying to change. Now, some of them are never. You know, there's racism and bigotry and some of those things that are just, we just can't get to everybody. But there must be enough of them who say, when we have an election, we want it to be in the most bipartisan way, with the most transparency, with the most accountability. I've been in Congress a long time. I've worked with the Republicans over the years, only in the last decade and a half or so, has it been so dangerous. Just last Saturday, not this one, but the one before, I was in D.C. on a, sat a Friday, it was Friday, to honor George Bush for the work that he did in PEPFAR. And when we were together talking before the program, we talked about all the things we did, the biggest energy bill in the history of our country, the TARP at the time of the the uh, meltdown of the financial institution, but he went through so many things that we had done working together. We had disagreements, there's no question. That's healthy, that's our country. But right now, people are breaking the law, uh, threatening lives in a way that is encouraged by the once and never future President of the United States. And that is a very dangerous thing. And again, I try to be respectful of all the people that sent our colleagues to Congress. But if you heard the things that they say, even a pro-Putin caucus, I mean, they don't officially call themselves that, but that's what they You're are. You're talking about the folks, Speaker, who are now advocating for no more mil military or financial aid to Ukraine. By extension, they've become a pro-Putin caucus. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's more than that. I yeah. mean, they, let me just get to your other point. Yeah. So when Kevin, when the, the speaker gave that, that was so totally irresponsible, dangerous, dangerous, beneath the dignity of the office that he held, he holds. Now, one other piece of that is when they do that, they'll say, well, Nancy did this. No, Nancy never did that. Again, but they'll say that, oh, no, this is just what she did. But no, we never did that. We never had any authority, nor would we use it to the detriment and danger of the American people. But that has to be passed on by the uh, security forces, uh, authorities in the Capitol as to what endangers people or not. And they never had any chance to review that. And why would you just give it 
If you if you think, oh, I want transparency, well, give it to everybody. Give it to everybody. Why right. would you give it to somebody who is a denier of our democracy and a denier of yeah. what happened that day? So that takes us to these people and the people in Ukraine. I visited there almost a year ago, right at the beginning. They're fighting for democracy, not only theirs, but ours and freedom in the world. Because if Putin gets away with this, all of the surrounding countries, whether they're NATO or not, are very concerned about what he will do next. But he's not the only one. There are other, um, uh, Oligar uh, well, we say um, the differences between a democracy and the lack of freedom that, that they are proposing. I'm going to come to Ukraine, and in fact, I want to come to Taiwan as well here in a minute. But since you teed up the subject of Speaker McCarthy, I want to ask you to... No, you teed it up. Well, Did he not teed okay. it up? <laughs> yes, but my, the, the, great, the great trick is to make you think it was your idea, not mine, oh. right? Um, I miss uh, that. Yeah. Uh, how's... Uh, <laughs> What, what is, the Tucker Carlson thing we've just talked about, but generally speaking, what's your assessment of how, how things are going in the House under his leadership at this point? Well, I hope for the best. I want everyone to succeed for, who has a sense of responsibility for our country. I want, what's his name, in a previous, uh, to succeed when he became president. But what I found, what I found out was that I had more respect for the office of president than he did. But you always want the president to succeed, right. make suggestions. On it. As far as this is concerned, the, uh, let's hope for the best. We always hope for the best. We're very proud of our new leadership, and it's really a comfort to me to move on because we had Hakeem Jeffries, Catherine Clark, uh, 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 Pete Aguilar, and, and Ted Lieu coming in uh, and just values-based, respectful of other people's opinions, and uh, again, see, my heart beat when I was there for 20 years as the leader, minority leader, or the speaker, the, this is how it beats. Member impact, member impact, member impact, member impact. What does this mean to the members, all of the members, as they represent their district? Representative is their title, Representative is their job description. So we need to listen, and I hope uh, that Kevin will listen to other than just the very radical right-wing fringe of his party, as we saw that night. I think that night, if, for anybody who saw it, you saw chaos on one side, unity on the other, a statement of values from Hakeem, and a just disastrous start, but let's hope Public opinion is everything. That was said by Abraham Lincoln. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. So your being here on a Sunday morning makes you very special in that you would give up your time to engage in this kind of a conversation. But public sentiment, the public is what will save our country from whatever Kevin has in mind. The, the last thing I want to, the last thing I want to ask you, Speaker, about the health of our democracy here gets to elections. The session following this one features Secretary of State Raffensperger of Georgia and uh, uh, Aguilar of Nevada talking about the administration of elections today and the challenges of giving everybody access to this fundamental right to vote. We seem to be in a place where that's harder today rather than easier. A place like Texas, it's become as a result of legislation passed here harder to vote rather than easier on the premise of non-existent, unproven voter fraud. What do we do about this as an element of the strength of our democracy, elections? Well, this is really uh, almost a perfect segue to your next subject because the r free and fair elections are something that we as Americans in a bipartisan way have gone around the country to the world observing to say was the election free and fair. Well, we have to have the same standard for our own country. And uh, one thing that is a priority for me still is we had a bill, For the People bill, and it's called For the People, and then it's a companion bill, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. If we can win this election, House, Senate, and of course retain the White House, uh, we would be able to pull back the curtain of filibuster 
so that we do not need 60 votes to pass legislation that supports free and fair elections, rather than enabling state by state the uh, suppression of the vote and in, in such a way that other countries look at and think, if we did that, you would say we are not promoting freedom. Well, we're not promoting freedom when we suppress the vote. But it's important to win the Senate in a way that the senators, you only need 51, you need 50 plus the vice president to pull back that curtain. So there's a, there's a path and it has to, we cannot keep going down the deterioration path. As I said at the beginning, we've always been more expansive about freedom until now with what policy measure I mentioned, but also in terms of the disregard uh, for the value of the right to vote, the dignity for people to be able to vote instead of saying you can't vote because of your whatever, don't look like me. Um, so, Speaker, back back to what we talked about briefly a few moments ago, and that is Ukraine. I'm going to add Taiwan to this bucket. The problem that we see is the rise of autocracy all over the world, dictatorships invading free nations. You have been involved in this issue for many, many years. You not only visited Ukraine, I believe, last May. You visited Taiwan in August, right? You have you have put yourself squarely in the conversation about promoting democracy in these places. Re reflect on that and where we are. I mean, I noticed that Speaker McCarthy was invited by President Zelensky to go to Ukraine, and he's declined to do it. He said, I don't need to go to Ukraine to know whether or not we're giving them a blank check while saying he supports Ukraine. He's apparently not going to go to Taiwan, as you did, to meet the president, but instead is going to meet the president of Taiwan at the Reagan Library in California. Shortly. That's you, a good thing. You think that is a good thing. Yeah. So talk a bit about Ukraine and Taiwan and, and, and where else in the world do you think we have challenges that we need to be focused on? Are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Follow the money. Over the years, money has fueled. Money of uh, buying uh, Russian oil is paying for the assault on democracy in Ukraine. In our country, I've been fighting uh, with, on the Chinese issue, uh, the issue with China for, since Tiananmen Square. Violations of human rights, lack of market access for our products into China, violations of our intellectual property, uh, proliferation of technologies for weapons of mass destruction to rogue countries, and the rest of that. But we in our country never we always would win the votes. I couldn't override a presidential veto. Democratic or Republican presidents always went along with, well, you know, if we trade, we're going to, human rights are going to improve. It had, actually, Iran has no indigenous nuclear technology. Most of it came from China. And if you want to, if you want to um, be a nuclear country, you need four things: technology, scientists to do put it together, delivery system to send it, and intent. Intent is the only thing that was indigenous to Iran. Most of the rest of that came from China. So anyway, I bring that to the point of, and we ignored that because big business in America wanted to do insurance and banking facilities and all, at the expense of small businesses in America wanted access to China. So you want to see China's building its military? You see how they're buying uh, votes at the UN in every place with, in small countries and in African countries and, and th throughout the world, they're buying geopolitical support. It's our money. We gave it to them. The trade deficit is enormous with China. So money has been the root of a lot of our problem in some of these places. And then you see copycats like uh, Hungary, not as bad as China and Russia, but nonetheless uh, on an undemocratic path. The fight globally is democracy versus, versus autocracy, as you said. Putin never thought that if we would um, 
that NATO would stick together on uh, opposing what he was doing in Ukraine. Now let me talk about our president and my youth. When I was a girl, before you were born, maybe even before your pres parents were born, <laughs> I went to the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. And at the inauguration, you all know, kids learn in school, it's their history book, it was my youth, the citizens of America ask not what America can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Okay. What your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You know that, right? But for me, the very next sentence that day, President Kennedy said, to citizens of the world ask not what America can do for you, but what we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. And that is, I think, what Joe Biden just did. When this happened, he didn't say, we're America and this is how it's gonna be and if you're with us, you do. He did not do that. He said, how can we work together for the freedom of mankind? And he was masterful at it. And what surprised, well, I don't know if it surprised him, but what Putin probably did not expect was not only was NATO strengthened, Finland and Sweden, who had resisted joining, said they wanted to join NATO too. So he strength, he Putin strengthened NATO, Joe Biden strengthened NATO, working together. And that is how I think we fight the autocracy is we do it working together, many democratic countries working together. I was told, I was just at the Munich conference, the security conference in um, Munich, and, uh, and they told me there, uh, some of the, it's, it's really mostly European countries, but they have guests from uh, all over the world, and they said, don't use the word democracy, use the word freedom. Because if you're talking to people and they don't like being called the global south, but that's how they had been referenced, you, Democracy is a form of government. Freedom is what resonates with them, their freedom. So again, this is a, an opportunity. It's who we are as a nation, and it is um, absolutely essential that we win this fight. So now you see China and Russia cozying, I don't know how cozy that will be. But I do know this, because of some change in policy that President Biden is putting forth vis-a-vis -vis China and trade, they don't have as much money as they used to. They're, they're um, not meeting payroll for some of their workers. They're spending a lot of money on defense. And um, uh, we, we have to join with the EU in using the leverage of this big market uh, to uh, uh, have the advantage be more even, the playing field more even, rather than to the Chinese advantage. But money, it comes back to the money. I mean, they wouldn't be the power they are of this big business in America in the 90s with the collaboration of Democrats and Republicans alike gave them this opportunity to have so much foreign exchange. They could buy votes in the UN arm their military and continue to, uh, except now they're getting a little weaker, as I understand. I mean, I've been fighting China so long that I have um, uh, friends there, you know, who say, they don't, but here's the thing. You can't just go after China with a cudgel. You have to say, we have to live on this planet together. How can we work together to save the planet from climate change? They're essential in that discussion. How can we try to work together with them on issues where we can find common ground, but at the same time, don't take us for a fool? But what I say to them in light of this issue is, if we refuse to speak out against violations of human rights in China because of commercial interest, we lose all moral authority to speak out against human rights any place in the world. They have a, a um, genocide, 
They have a genocide going on, as you know, in Shenzhen uh, province uh, with the Uyghurs. They're d destroying democracy in Hong Kong and takes us to Taiwan. So when I was going to Taiwan, there was, oh, the president of Ta China doesn't want you to go. Oh, really? Uh, we were, you know. <laughs> The, the fact is that we were not advocating for a change in policy. We have a one China policy. We were not advocating for that. But we also have a policy that says that any change in the relationship between China and Taiwan must be peaceful, must be peaceful and agreed to by both countries. So we, I was never going to let the president of China isolate Taiwan. And so that's why we went. And do you know? We have set a record of more people following our tagline on the plane, ever millions of people. And uh, when we got there, we had a tremendous, tremendous welcome for America, for democracy, for freedom. And I think that uh, the uh, speaker welcoming the, uh, the president of, of Taiwan at the Reagan Library is, is a good thing. So you, you don't think he should go as you went? No, everybody does. You know, I'm, People do their thing. I mean, I, 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 I was. I knew I had to go. I had been fighting China for, as I say, right. a long time, uh, and there was no. And I've been to Taiwan before, yeah. and we have a big uh, commercial interest with Taiwan as well in terms of semiconductors and the rest of that. So we have uh, our own um, uh, things to learn from Taiwan right. in terms of their success. Now, as as you know, uh, Madam Speaker, what you've just talked about overseas is going to be on the ballot in the next election. We're going to be talking about Ukraine. We're going to be talking about Taiwan. We're talking about it now. But as the presidential campaign gets ramped up in 24, these issues are literally going to be on the ballot. So I want to spend the last couple of minutes we have talking about that. Um, how do you think the Republican field, first of all, for the next election is shaping up? You are about as astute a political observer as there is. Go. I am the, I'm the least astute and knowledgeable person about what goes on in the Republican Party. <laughs> I just want them to be the Republican Party, and that's by their own definition, but not as a cult to a thug, as I said earlier. Uh, the, uh, it will be interesting, to, the public observance, awareness of it all is going to be very, very important. If they have a contest about who can be as far radical right wing and negative on all things, it would be a disservice to our country and to the Republican Party and the contributions they have made. So I'm not a good person to ask about what goes on in the Republican Party. I am just hopeful because I don't, I don't until 2016, election, somebody wins, somebody loses, and then you go forward. But that night, it wasn't just about what happened in the election. It was about something that happened in our country. And I thought perhaps with the responsibility, there could be a, shall we say, opportunity for the, the elected president to, um, take it to a better place, instead it took it to a worse place. But to question the validity of the election and the manner in which he did, and you'll, you've heard all of the rejection of any of his ideas in the courts and all the rest. Let me just say, when he lost, he had the right to question and go to court. That's all part of the system. It, it was hopeless, but nonetheless, Allowed, you know, you can, but when he started an insurrection and, and just perpetuating the big lie, then that fell into the realm of doing a bad thing for our country. So in terms of the election, uh, let us hope that how, that some candidates on the Republican Party will be responsible to the oath of office. Uh, what we have to do, though, is just take it to the kitchen table. This is what people need to be able to reach their own fulfillment. So it's about lowering cost, bigger paychecks, safer communities, and, and 
again, putting people over politics. And hopefully that will win over some of those who, uh, on their side, who would, who would just by habit vote that way because the country really needs us to come together. So it has to be respectful, accountable, transparent, and worthy of the vision of our founders for this great country, the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform to protect our freedom, and worthy of the aspirations of our children to live in a democratic country as an example to the world. Uh, Speaker, I appreciate you saying let the Republicans talk about the Republicans. I don't know the party as much. We'll have a Republican here in a couple of hours, Governor Sununu of New Hampshire, who is talking about running potentially for president. He said a couple of weeks ago on Meet the Press, Don, uh, Meet the Press Donald Trump will not be the nominee of our party. I am certain of that. He had certainty about that. Are you as certain that the former president will not be the next candidate? No, but I do say this. If he is, we impeached him twice, and he's going to lose twice. You're confident. <laughs> Speaker, uh, it, it was reported last December that you and Leader Schumer, now Majority Leader Schumer, again, uh, went, went to, uh, to encourage the current president, President Biden, to run again for office. Is that true? It was reported that you had encouraged him, despite the fact that there was some chatter, well, will he run again? Should other people potentially think about running against him? You encouraged President Biden to run for another term. Well, I certainly hope that he will. I'm sure that in any conversation, uh, Chuck, Majority Leader Schumer, and I have with the president is always encouraging. We don't talk that much politics, actually. Right. <laughs> well, let me ask you then, Speaker, let me just and ask you straight away. I don't know if away. he mattered that, what we would say, but nonetheless, right. no, we don't talk much about, we, we usually we talk about, you know, uh, right. job creation, 12 million jobs under president. This past two years have been um, so remarkable, historic, 12 million jobs created, a great reduction in the national debt. You, it, let me just tell you this because it's important to know. People are, it's counterintuitive for the public to think that Democrats are the ones who reduce the national debt, but we are, whether it was, whether it was Clinton, whether it was Obama, and now Biden. And so this president has created jobs, redu is, re is in the process of reducing the national debt and is doing so in a way that addresses the needs of America's working families. He beat, what's his name, once. So, you know, uh, that's a credential, and, uh, and he's, more importantly than that, addressed the needs of America's working families. So any, if he, any conversation I would have with him would be, I think you should run. I don't know if he's going to run. He hasn't shared that confidence with me. But you're for it, if he does. Of course. Yeah, I, I am definitely for it. And I, I, um, I hope that sometime soon he will make that decision. Right. Everybody said, well, he's old and all that. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you something. He has great judgment. When you're making a judgment about a leader, what is their vision? What is their vision for the country? His vision is, is just such a beautiful one about fairness uh, for America's working families, justice in terms of how we do things, uh, always for the children. What is his knowledge? What do you know? And so when people are running and they're new, and I say this to women especially, when show your, show your why. Why are you running? Show your what. What do you know about the subject that you're espousing? You don't have to know everything. The president does, but you don't because you're just running. Show how. How are you going to get this done? Are you a strategic thinker? He certainly has a vision. He knows what it's all about. He's been vice president, president, senator for so long. He knows strategically how to get things done. We didn't lose any vote. And that's all up here in the heart, heart to heart with the American people, great empathy for the American people. And, they, and he connects with them. So I think that it would be 
efficient for us to have a president seek re-election and that um, we should be moving on with right. it when we can. But whatever it is, whatever decision he makes, we'd like to right. know. Does, does it concern you, Speaker, that there was a poll of uh, Democrats at the end of last year, AP poll, only 37% of Democrats now apparently want him to seek re-election. If the record that you just described is as good as it is, why are so many in his party reluctant to say that he should run again? Well, let me just put this in another context. I, I was honored by the Democratic National Committee in Philadelphia. Yeah, where were we? Philadelphia, <laughs> recently. And I've been to so many cities. I was just in Chicago and here. I'll go to LA tomorrow. Right. In Philadelphia. And the press was taking a poll of all those people. A large percentage of them said, I don't think he should run. 98% of them said, but if he does, we're all for him. So it's one thing to say what you might prefer. It's another thing to s say what you will do if he does, if he does run. He's absolutely a magnificent leader. He is um, younger than I am, so I don't know what the... <laughs> So I don't know what the problem is, but in, <laughs> but in any event, um, uh, I hope that he will soon make some announcement. Yeah. When you ask that question, I, I don't exactly remember it that way. You know, we probably said, yeah, you should run or something, but where'd you get that? Uh, Washington Post. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they're matter. pretty good. So I, uh, yeah. I'm in, the, in the remaining uh, couple seconds we have, you've talked about in an affirmative way everything that the president has done that you support. Yesterday was the two-year anniversary of the signing of the American yeah. Rescue Plan. You had, of course, the big infrastructure bill, which brought money to all 50 states to support a range of things. You mentioned the economy. You mentioned the jobs. I want to ask you about two other things. You were not happy that the president announced after the House vote that he would sign the D.C. crime bill. That he well, did not give the House a heads up earlier. Yeah. But, that was one area in which you and the president disagree. Well, that's, that's a, a, a technical area about one issue. But here's the thing. You have to understand this. In the House, the Republicans put those things in the mix so they can turn it into an ad. They already have turned it into an ad right. for people who voted for the, the uh, right of the District of Columbia to make its own decisions. They already made, that. those ads are already in the can and some of it beyond the can uh, on that. So if they're doing gotcha stuff and the president is not going to even sign it, it would be useful if we knew. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he said it before the Senate voted. Right, and, and, but and didn't that. say it before the House. Yeah. Um, just because we're in Texas, I need to ask you about a headline in the New York Times this week that said the U.S. is said to consider uh, reinstating the detention of migrant families. This was a policy from the previous administration that was quite controversial, meaningful to us. You vehemently opposed that policy in the last administration. This was what you tweeted the last time we detained migrant families, September of 2018. I've said it before, I'll say it again, locking children in cages does nothing to protect Americans. Make no mistake, this is child abuse. If it was child abuse under Trump, would it be child abuse under Biden? Let me just say that that um, I think it's really thank you for bringing that up. The president has never said this. This was a notion that was floating in the Department of Homeland Security. It didn't receive resonance or even the support of the secretary. But somebody put that out there that that's on the table. He has never said that. You don't think it's on the table? No, I don't think it's on the table. What I do know is not only on the table, but always and also at the border. We must protect our border. That is our responsibility, to secure our border. We must have a, 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 an initiative that enables us to respect uh, refugees and, and um, um, asylum seekers at the border. So we have to do that better. We also have to recognize crime, uh, climate change is affecting a lot of people coming because they can't farm and they, all that. Recognize some of the causes of why people come here uh, to the United States. 
and I think that they, we should be doing the um, adjudication of it at a previous border, like Guatemala, Mexico. But in any event, the president never said that. It's gotten such blowback from people who care about immigrants and children. When the president, former, you know, did that, it was, uh, <laughs> it was horrible in terms of what it meant, taking children, in many cases, out of the arms of their parents. I don't even know how some of the Hispanic evangelicals put up with that, except Dobbs. You know, because I said to them, how could you put up with this? Well, he's doing the best he can. But in any event, we must do the best we can in terms of securing our border. I'll just close by saying, yes. when the president, what's his name, did the um, um, Muslim ban, do you remember that? It was, right, it was right now, like two months after he was president, he did the Muslim ban. And, and people responded, the soldiers responded and said, no, we have to bring in the people who helped us in the war. And the, a, a, a thousand uh, State Department people departed from tradition and signed letters saying this is wrong, all that. Uh, the, uh, so we heard from, we had a mock, a mock um, hearing because we didn't have the power. We, we weren't in power, but we had, and the evangelicals, the actual association of evangelicals came and they said in their testimony, the crown jewel of American humanitarianism is our refugee resettlement program. So this has, we have a responsibility in that regard. It doesn't mean reverting back to that policy, but it does mean with respect, all God's children with a secure border for the greatest country that ever existed in the history of the world. And we must continue to make it so. The flag is still there. That's my motto. The flag is still there of our great country. Madam Speaker, we're out of time. Thank you for coming back to Austin. We're so happy to have you here.